our our scripture again this week is um, from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. And uh, Nate is actually uh, focusing on the second three, or the uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, characteristics this week. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Um, based on my profession, uh, I've been to a few funerals. Uh, it's part of what pastors do. And one of the things at funerals that's interesting is you'll hear these comments of, um, she lived a good life, or he lived a good life. What does that mean? Like when people say that, oh man, she really lived a good life. What, is, what does that mean? And at the end of your life, whenever that is, I know I'm starting off a little morbid, but at the end of your life, whenever that is, do you want someone to say something similar? Like, oh, you know, Kim lived a good life. Do we want that? <laughs> yeah, I think we want someone to say that. What do you want them to mean, though, when they say, D lived a good life? What do you want them to mean when they say that? The meaning of the good life is important. Because I think there's a lot of definitions in our world of what the good life is. And as we go back to the time that I'm preaching from where Jesus is uh, interacting with religious folks, they had a definition of the good life that I want to share with you. I think it's interesting. For them, the good life was, um, for these religious folks, if you were a part of the elite, if you had power, if you had knowledge, if you had a lot of land, um, then, then you were kind of living the good life. And, and these were the people that God gave 10 really good rules to, like through Moses. And they thought, well, those 10 were pretty good and helpful, but we should probably add several hundred extra rules to them because we want to be super holy, right? So the rabbis and others, they added all these extra rules onto what God already gave them. And their favorite thing to do is to make sure that they followed all these little rules about, can you eat a lobster? What can you do on Saturday? Should I cut my beard? Um, all these different little rules. And not only did they want to, some of you answered yes when I said, should I cut my beard? <laughs> I heard that. Um, but when, when, he, when they would say these types of things, it was not just that they would follow all these meticulous laws, but they wanted to make sure everybody else was following them, including Jesus. And once you made sure that you were following all these rules and that everyone else was following them, then you'd achieved the good life. Lacking mercy, lacking grace. And there's Jesus probably just scratching his head going, really? Like, understanding the creation of God, and that's how we're going to say, here's how we need to live out our life, by putting a bunch of extra rules and then making sure everybody obeys them, and that is the full and abundant life. So as Jesus is thinking, how did we get there? Um, this sermon that I, I mentioned to you is the most provocative sermon I think Jesus gave, the Sermon on the Mount. And he begins with the Beatitudes. And all that means is blessings. That's what uh, Ginger just read. And so what he's doing is, Jesus is painting this new picture of a different set of values, a different kind of kingdom, a different kind of king. He's actually painting a picture of the good life that flies in the face of what the religious people of that day thought was the good life. And so you can see why Jesus really stirred up a lot of people, because this picture he's painting is the complete opposite of what the people of that day thought the good life was. So I want to read three more of these characteristics uh, of, of the kingdom. So as, as Jesus is saying these characteristics, he's describing kingdom people, 
and what his kingdom looks like. And so here's the three we're going to focus on uh, this evening. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And that was the one that Kim just did, and I love it because it has a food description there. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And I described last week that the word blessed literally means you are on the right path if. You are on the right path if. And so going back to that first one, hunger and thirst for righteousness. So as Kim was saying, the definition of righteousness, we have to be careful because sometimes when you hear it, it can be like self-righteous, right? And that Matt is so self-righteous. That is not what this is talking about. And Matt is not self-righteous. Um, we're talking about being right with God, those people who hunger and thirst for being uh, in a right relationship with God. And that they hunger and thirst, that their hunger and thirst can only be satisfied. Don't miss this. Their hunger and thirst can only be satisfied by communion with God, that their hunger and thirst can only be addressed by their God. And so um, here's kind of the rub that I see. In our culture, there are so many options we face every day, even today, of things that can satisfy us or we believe will satisfy us and fill us. There's so many options. Uh, for instance, these new kind of uh, soda thing machines in restaurants where you used to just take your cup and go, Psh, now there's a robot, you know, and you have to push all the different things, and you can push if you want raspberry in it and all these different. I have anxiety as I'm sitting there trying to push. It's so much easier to go right over here to the sweet tea and go, er, not because sweet tea is better, but because it's less anxiety-provoking to make all those choices. I don't want to make all those, those choices. To think about it where we live and what we're talking about today, to hunger and thirst for Jesus Christ, for more of God in our lives. It's almost easier sometimes to fill up on other good things. This is where a lot of my friends who are Christians struggle, including myself. It's not that our lives are so full of bad things, maybe some of us, but most of us, our lives are chock full of good things, leaving little room for that which is great. So I think about like from a snack analogy, going to the snack cabinet, you know you're hungry, and you start kind of munching on things that are okay, and then you get completely full and you go, I know why I came in here for that but now I am stuffed. There's no more room for it. And so, things that we think are good, and they are good, education, our families, our work, health, sports teams, leisure, all these things which I think God gives us to enjoy, we fill up on them. And then, then we struggle because we have no room for anything else. And what I want to point out is the things that we often, and that Nate Stratman can fill up on, they are good, but they're temporal. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying, would you fill up on the things that are great and eternal? We fill up on those things which are temporal. It doesn't mean they're evil, but they fade away. But what the Sermon on the Mount points to is that which is eternal. And so those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're hungering and thirsting for something that is not theirs. They're hungering and thirsting, um, and they're not about their own righteousness, but about someone else's God's. And then Jesus keeps painting this picture, and he says, uh, blessed are the merciful, or those who are merciful are on the right path, and they will be shown mercy. Uh, what is a merciful person? I love this definition. I wonder how you would define it, but here's how I would define a merciful person. A merciful person, and it goes a lot to the story Dee just shared, a merciful person is someone who sees the needs of others and doesn't just tweet about it, doesn't just put it on social media, doesn't just put, I love those kind of people on their bumper sticker or shirt, but it's someone who sees the needs of others and goes to extravagant lengths to address it, to help them. The merciful person sees the needs of others and actually goes to a costly measure to address those things that they see. This is a great definition of Jesus' love to us. That Jesus sees us, loves us, but knows that we're needy. I, I know I'm needy. I need things. I need things I don't even know I need. And Jesus sees the need, and what does he do? He goes to costly, extravagant measures to address the need. So those who are merciful really live out the golden rule. They're the ones who, who say, all we want to see happen is... Uh, to do to others as they would have do unto us or backwards and forwards, and I just totally butchered the golden rule. But 
They not only want mercy and will receive mercy, but give mercy. Now, if we're honest for a second, I mean, first of all, who doesn't love a little mercy or grace in this? I mean, everybody likes to receive mercy and grace. Amen? Cop pulls you over. Oh, please, please. Right? Or we're getting in trouble. Oh, just give me, give me a little grace. Little mercy, mercy, please. It's much harder to give grace and mercy, isn't it? Right? So the, the merciful people receive mercy when it's due, but they're not stingy with it either. They, they give mercy as it's needed. But we forget God's mercy. This is the rub to me. Blessed are the merciful, but I, I would say that we can forget uh, the mercy that we've been given. I think some of us maybe have never even tasted the mercy of Jesus Christ. Some of us maybe don't know the full mercy that God offers us. And, and uh, the people who don't know, do know mercy are those who have experienced mercy, right? So if you give mercy, it's because you've received mercy. If you want someone else to experience it, that's because you've experienced it in a way that's maybe changed your life. And so you want everyone else to know it. So the example I would use is um, there's a restaurant I really love in this town because of two things they serve. It's called Moe's Barbecue, and it's on Oleander. And they have chicken wings that are smoked and not with all the sauce over there, so it's friendly to the beard. And, <laughs> and collard greens. And the way I love their wings, and I love their collard greens. I'll be there after church. Now, I, I take other people there. I talk about them all the time. I'm like, have you had Moe's smoked wings? Like I, I'm an evangelist for <laughs> these wings and collards. Now, you're thinking, is he really going to associate collard greens and chicken wings with the mercy of Jesus Christ? No, they're so different. But if I'm so excited to share about chicken wings and collard greens, I pray I would be more excited to share about the mercy Jesus has extended to me, and I'd be willing to share that with others. To say, hey, look, look what God has done for me, and to be very aware about the mercy that Jesus has extended to us. And when you've tasted this mercy, and this is where Dee's story to me comes in, when you've tasted the mercy of Jesus, I believe then you are willing to help carry the burdens of others. If you see someone that has a financial burden, you take the money you have and you help use that money for that person. And what, when you're doing that, you're getting under that, that thing, that log, that pressure that's holding them down, and you take that burden with them. And you start to carry it with them. People in this church have physical issues, physical needs. When you say, I'm going to help you with your physical needs, you come under that with them and you carry the burden with them. When they have an emotional need, and, and Dee was saying about being in the ashes, Kathy comes and gets in the ashes and she gets down and bears some of that burden with her. Folks, that's what it means to be merciful. Some of you have received mercy from others. Some of you has, have extended mercy. These are acts of mercy that are depictors or descriptions of people in the kingdom of God. There was a, a picture or a, an article or video I posted this week, maybe some of you all saw this, of a guy named Deshaun Watson who was a football player at Clemson. Did anyone see this thing about Deshaun? So Deshaun is 22 years old. He gets his first check in the NFL, and my guess is it's bigger than most checks you have received. Uh, and so his first paycheck, what does he do? He's in Houston for the Houston Texans. These are cafeteria workers. He gives his whole first paycheck to them because they lost their houses in a hurricane. And he gives it to them with a smile on his face. He wasn't trying to make a big deal about it. It just happened someone had a camera, a phone to film him do it. Why was Deshaun merciful? Why did Deshaun get down like this and carry some of the financial burden of these women? Part of the reason, I believe, is because Deshaun had seen that before. There's a really famous running back football player named Warwick Dunn. And when Deshaun was 13, Warwick, through Habitat for Humanity, bought him a house. And so he saw this. He saw, oh my gosh, there's, a, there's an athlete that looks like me and talks like me, and he's going to use his money for good. He's going to extend mercy to us, and he's going to take some of the burden with our family because we don't have a home. Deshaun sees that at 22 years of age. Let me tell you what I was doing at 22. I wasn't giving my first paycheck to anybody, people. And here's Deshaun because he'd seen the mercy acted out he too took some of that burden from these women. It's an act of mercy. Mercy is fundamental to a relationship with God and to loving neighbors. You cannot love God and you cannot love your neighbor without mercy being central. My question for us to think about, and I've thought about this all week because I've been working on this sermon, 
Who in your life could use God's mercy through you, from you? I know who it is without a doubt. I know the people who need it from me without a doubt in my life. Who in your life right now could use God's mercy as extended from you? Who is it right now that needs you to come and do this? To carry some of the burden financially, physically, spiritually, emotionally, saying, hey, I'll walk with you. I'm not going to fix it, but I'm going to carry this with you. I'm going to sit in the ashes. And for Kathy and Dee, just so you know, this story wasn't a short story. It was over a long period of time that they walked together. And the story ain't done, right? It's, it continues on as they walk together and bear each other's burdens. The third characteristic that Jesus says he's painting this great picture of the kingdom of God, of kingdom people, he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I love that. So let's define this real quick. The word pure, what the word pure means in this is not perfect, but it means single, like single attention, not mixed up without any additives. Pure, like, I I don't know, I think of honey. I love honey. I like to see through the bottle of honey. There's nothing in my honey. It's just straight up honey. My friend Alan brings me these big jugs of honey from the mountains. It says pure honey. I like it pure. Don't flavor it. Don't put anything in it. I want it pure, right? So that's what it means is single focused, no additives, nothing added to it. So a pure heart. Now, we've kind of made the word heart only emotional, and it is not. And I've talked about this before in a, in a sermon, but the heart is um, similar to the soul or the will. It is the place where thoughts, feelings, and actions happen in us. So Jesus is saying, blessed are the people with pure, not mixed up, no additives, hearts, souls, wills, their their thoughts, their feelings, and their actions. So I would say that the purity of heart is kind of the mark of real Christianity. Think about that for a second. The purity of the heart is a mark of real Christianity. It is the most important change of all the other changes. Some of us want to change our behaviors and decisions and all these other things, and we we change them for a while. But it is when the heart changes, uh, everything else changes. Like a a, a statement I always say to working with youth over the years is, when you get your heart in line with Jesus, your tail follows, right? Right? And so often in our parenting and our teaching and preaching, it's all about the tail. Like, don't do that. You should do that. But when the heart gets in line, wherever the heart goes, the tail goes. And if you don't believe me, you should just try it. You know, just lead, walk around like this. And wherever you go, your tail follows. When our heart is in line with God, when our pure heart is in line for God, seeking righteousness, that our actions follow. But often I feel like we put so much emphasis on the actions. We focus on behaviors and not the heart or the root. And so an impure heart, if you've ever struggled with this idea of having an impure heart, it is not a quick fix. A hard heart, it is not a a quick fix. And and I I like therapy. I like counseling. But therapy and counseling does not change our hearts. When you go to therapy or counseling, it reveals the impurities of our heart. Right? You can go to counseling like, aha. But I promise you, I've met a lot of good therapists and counselors. They are not God. They will not change your heart. They'll give you some pointers and some ideas, but it is only God that can change our heart. And I know sometimes we don't believe that. We want to read all these other books and do the seven steps to be the world's most best, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, it is only God who can change our hearts. So why are these people, the pure in heart, why are they blessed? Jesus says they are blessed because they're the ones who are going to see God. They're the ones who are going to experience God. They're the ones who are going to know the power of God. The psalmist actually asked this great question in Psalm 23, verses 3 through 4. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? The one who has clean hands, right? Clean actions and a pure heart. That's the one who will experience the power and presence of God. It's the beginning of a pure heart. So, What are the steps? And I'm not going to say, here are the seven steps to the Beatitudes. But as I've thought about these three Beatitudes, what do we do on Monday? What do we do tomorrow morning when we wake up to reflect God's word in our lives? I would say this. If you have not realized this, I would ask you to realize this. That when we fill ourselves up on the temporal things in this world, we become famished and parched. Right? That there's the things we can fill ourselves up on actually have no nutrients. There's a whole lot of good that we can be busy doing, but it leaves uh, little room for the great. Have you ever asked God to make you hungry? Have you ever asked God to make you thirsty? 
Besides the prayer, God, use me, I think a great prayer is, God, would you make me hungry for you? God, would you make me thirsty for you? God, I've been a Christian for 20 years and just kind of going and doing all the things and checking the boxes, and I've lost my hunger and thirst for you. God, would you make me hungry again? Maybe some of you are thinking, like me, you're lacking mercy in your life. And if you're lacking mercy, to me, it's a pause and a deep reflection on the merciful acts of Jesus in our lives. I I really believe that when we don't extend grace and mercy to others, it's because our memories are messed up and we have forgotten how merciful and gracious Jesus has been to us. But when you remember that, And that's why we gather, that's why we read scripture, that's why we sing songs, is to be reminded of the grace and mercy of Jesus so that we extend it to others. But when you start to become stingy with your grace and mercy, it's because you, maybe deep down inside, and I start to believe that God might be stingy with his grace and mercy too. But when we read scripture, we're assured that he's not. Some of you might be thinking that your heart needs focusing, that, that your heart's going too many different places. You're trying to make everybody happy, and no one's happy. And so what does it look like to have our heart focus solely on God? I would say that the prayer there is to ask God to purify our hearts. Now, in most purification processes, they're difficult. To purify something, like if you think about a precious metal, it takes heat to rid ourselves of the idols and things that get in the way of us truly loving God. And so for me, the prayer, if you're having heart issues, is to ask God to purify your heart. And the other one I love is to awaken it. To ask God to go, blow his breath on your heart that it may become alive again in Jesus. Folks, um, Christianity is not about making nice people. Christianity is not about making... Uh, people who just follow rules or moral. The Beatitudes describe a person who is new. Christianity is about making new people, not nice people. The, the, the Beatitudes describe uh, a new person in Jesus Christ, in and through Jesus Christ. That's what the Beatitudes are. The person who is deeply merciful, the person who has a, has a pure heart, is one who's been made new in Jesus Christ. So, to tag back with my first kind of story. What are people going to say about me when I die? What are people going to say about you when you die? Here's the obituary I want. I pray that people would say, Nate was hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Nate was merciful. Nate had a pure heart. And the only way that someone like me can have that kind of Jesus likeness is through his merciful love. And so my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that we would live in greater proximity to Jesus and greater proximity to our neighbor. Amen? Let me pray. Lord God, um, if these were just my words and some ideas that I had, we know that we're in trouble. My prayer is that these words uh, are your words breathed through me to this group of people that we may receive encouragement and hope through your word, direction through your word, that there is a new way to live life, that there is an abundant and good life that is really different than the life that we see around us. God, we need your strength and power to do it because when we try in our own strength, it, it doesn't work. So my prayer is that your picture of this kingdom becomes a reality and it starts with me, starts with us, starts with this church, starts with this other churches in this community, that we would live out this new kingdom mindset that you gave us in this sermon. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.